that's kind of what white peopleology is about is how we learn to to develop these ways of communicating and these ways of talking these ways of being that are basically centered on whiteness and so because i never learned that uh i think i talk to people the way that I, I talk to white people the way that i talk to black people and i don't feel the need to do this uh code switching thing that we have been used to all of our lives and so the fact that you were homeschooled was one of the things that kind of struck me right and the the way that you explained that your mother wanted to try this on to say if I can prevent my children from having this kind of exposure in those development developmental years, what will be the result? And so that was part of what was powerful for me to con conceive of in your story, because, you know, for me, not only was I, you know, reared in these white majority schools, but also when it came time for going to college, I thought of HBCUs as completely out of the realm of possibility because I felt like that is what privileged Black people do. That is what Black people with a lot of money do. That is what you know well-to-do Black people do. And so it definitely wasn't anything that I thought was a possibility. So that meant that even in college, I'm still in this situation. So I think that for me, what's been interesting is um, having so deliberately to need to develop the skills to not take on the BS, to, to be in these situations, be surrounded by white people and notice how mediocre they are. That has been a deliberate practice for me. So part of what I hear you saying is that the humor that I so admire in you is developed mostly because of not having to do the kind of deliberate work that I'm describing for myself. That's that's really interesting. Right. I think I think that's part of it. I think part of it comes from a premise that kind of uh, rides, it extrudes itself through all of my writing, and that there's this assumption that I think people find funny, and I've developed it kind of knowing now that people find it funny. But the premise of all of those disparate jokes is based in the belief that, oh, like I assume that blackness is normal and all of the white stuff is crazy to me. And people <laughs> think that's funny, but it's really how I think. Your book is based on white mediocrity, which is kind of like one of my favorite subjects and <laughs> the you know how it is we uh is woven itself through history that i you know one of my suppositions is that it's not just black excellence that that uh white fears it's just excellence in general and even as a white person you mediocrity is more rewarded than even white excellence because you know, that's, I think, the root of the conservative fear of, for for instance, the liberal bias in academia. They don't just hate, like, uh, the progressive Black people. They hate progressive white people because other, if you start basing everything on data and science and excellence, then what chance would a white person have mm -hmm. in this world, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's one of, that's always been one of my suppositions is that it's not just a fear of black excellence it is because because white supremacy has a goal and the goal is not to just elevate whiteness it is to elevate mediocrity right because you know if all of the greatest white people you know made it to the top then they wouldn't have to worry about you know the mediocre white people what that the white supremacy is is to ensure that the mediocre white people rise faster and higher than the most excellent non-white people that is absolutely the case absolutely and i think you know this idea of holding ourselves to higher standards like i'm always trying to encourage my white colleagues my white students to hold themselves to higher standards because that as you put it is exactly what is trying to be prevented 
only if we are invested in higher standards would those who are refusing to actually make this country better, right? Like if we say, for example, that we care about something like equal opportunity, if we say that we care about fairness and um, all of those things that we say are American, then why wouldn't we be invested in that actually being in place? And it's only, as you say, keeping mediocrity rewarded that gives people this investment. So for me, the reason why it's so important to the book from Slave Cabins to the White House is simply because I'm trying to have us really pay attention to how much even the small successes of Black people are pounced on. And as you say, it's only because you want the lowest of white people to succeed over excellent Black people that that has been such a constant, constant problem. Yeah. But yeah, yeah that's, that's always been my supposition is that, and that's why I think when you talk about issue, you have to talk about like the, 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 the measure is not if the black, the excellent black people will make it to the top because, you know, uh, excellent black people will rise maybe, right? But does a mediocre average intelligence black ch child have the chance to rise to the level of a mediocre, you know, average intelligence white child? And that, and, or, uh, uh, you know, the dumbest black, the dumbest white child will probably make it further than a reasonably intelligent black child simply because of the way our society is structured. So you can't say, for instance, like I always say, when I go to a position, I want a black position, right? Now, a lot of people say that's racist, but I know because of the way this country is structured that if you are a black doctor or a black lawyer, you are probably the smartest person in your elementary school, mm -hmm. the smartest person in your high school, you're probably a valedictorian, you're probably the smartest person in your college class. Mm -hmm. And if you're a white person, your daddy might've been a doctor. You know, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's that comparison that I am always, that always interests me, right? right? To become, like, just like Chris Rock said, right? Like, he is the most famous comedian in the world. He lives on a block with Mary J. Blige, one of the most successful singers in the world, and a white chiropractor, and yep. a white business. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so that is the comparison. That's, the, that's, that's how America works. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much. And, you know, I'll just continue to, to watch your career and, and be inspired because like I said, I'm just not as funny. And I really, really crave that humor. It helps me to stay sane. So you are doing the Lord's work, in my opinion. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you.